Hi, everyone, and welcome to the IoT Transformers podcast, where we bring you success stories of customers transforming their business by harnessing the power of the Internet of Things. This is your host, Deb Oberly, and your co-host... This is Danny Diaz. And we're both part of the IoT Global Black Belt team at Microsoft. We have a great show today, so let's get started. With us today, we have John Biagioni, president of Dynisco, and welcome, John. Thank you, Deb. Uh, first, I'd like to start uh, with a little history of Dynisco, just so people are grounded. Uh, Dynisco has been in business for about 65 years. We're headquartered in Franklin, Massachusetts, uh, but we also have facilities in Heilbronn, Germany, and in Parak, Malaysia. Um, our business is really focused around the plastics industry. We've traditionally provided sensing and instrumentation and polymer test equipment to that industry so that they can check the uh, properties of how they're actually making plastics. Uh, the company's main core uh, around is focused on solving customers' pain points in the sensing and rheological space of plastics. And we do that by providing a window into their process for the information that is provided by our sensors and instruments. Great, great. Thanks for the background, John. So um, when did you and your team, I know you have a solution um, in the marketplace now, um, when did you and your team start to think about bringing an IoT solution to market and why? What, what were the big bets that you were making as a company um, when you started to embark upon this? Well, now to think about it, it's been about three years ago that Danisco started on this journey. Uh, that's when we really started talking about the strategy around IoT, and we previously had no experience in this space. So as I mentioned before, we've traditionally made sensors and instrumentation and polymer test equipment. So that's more of traditional iron versus software. Um, we definitely had a case for change. We had burning bridges, and I want to talk about that. Plus, we also had opportunities in providing what we would see as a unified cloud plat platform for information for, from our sensors and instruments that could eventually be put together. Uh, let's first talk about uh, the issues with legacy. We had three lab instruments that had eight boards that needed redesign because they were end-of-life issues. We also had three proprietary software packages that were all dated, and soon uh, we're going to have more issues as Windows 7 is going to be desupported at the end of this year. So that, that basically was truly a burning bridge situation. Uh, but we also had a lot of opportunities to overcome. Uh, Danisco used this opportunity to leapfrog our competitors and generate one platform that's coded at the OS layer versus the hardware layer. Traditionally, we would actually be uh, writing to a, a microprocessor. Uh, by actually focusing on writing to the OS layer, we basically avoided all those traditional issues with worrying about writing to USB sticks or am I going to have a keyboard or localization support. When you actually write to um, a micro, language support could come down to I have to learn how to draw a font on a screen. By actually writing to the Windows 10 IoT stack, uh, basically Dinosco became hardware agnostic and we were able to use commercial off-the-shelf equipment for our control systems. That really uh, freed us up to focus on the things that were important to our customers, and that was getting the information out of the sensors and utilizing it, or getting the information out of the rheological equipment and utilizing it. So our big bet, really, at the time was using Windows 10 IoT, because at the time, when we first looked at it three years ago, it didn't have an on-board, uh, an on-screen keyboard. It didn't support a capacitive touchscreen. And there was a limited support of um, single board computers available to the Windows 10 IoT core stack. But we knew that Microsoft was a leader in this space, and we knew that these problems would be solved. And sure enough, all those issues have been addressed, and there's much more functionality over the Windows 10 IoT core of today than there was three years ago. In terms of results, uh, Danisco was able to integrate these single board computers running the Windows 10 IoT stack into uh, th two of the three instruments that we needed to refresh so far. And we've seen both the cost reduction and we were able to actually increase price on the instrument because of the extra features that we're able to bring into the stream. Uh, the amount of sensing that comes along with these single board computers is much more than what anyone is used to seeing. Uh, 
simple fact that most of these uh, SBCs actually allow for location-based services allowed us to actually patent a specific feature on geolocation of our instrument. Um, one thing that uh, people don't understand is that, uh, or maybe they didn't know, is that gravity, believe it or not, is not constant. We, we know that because we end up building pressure equipment. We know that from the equator to the pole is about a 0.3% difference in gravitational impact. Um, but people that make instruments that are based upon gravity, that use mass as a force, uh, basically lose that capability unless they know where it was built and where it's installed. We actually know both of those. And because our system locates, we're able to actually file a patent on that capability to correct for gravity. Uh, this is the second patent that we actually derive from around our IoT and IoT connected devices. So it's actually pretty important that we actually went to that. And that was a big bet. Though. So that's, uh, that's just pretty interesting, John. Uh, it's a, I learned a, a new thing. I, I didn't know that there was that variation uh, in gravity. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to go look that up now and learn, learn a little <laughs> bit more about it. Uh, but, but at a high level, uh, can you tell us uh, what your solution um, you know the value that it brings to your customer and uh, and 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 what exactly does it do? Sure. Um, I'll start off at uh, some of the actually uh, more uh, expensive and enabled instruments, and that would be our online rheological instruments that are used on a production line. When you think about that, think about an extruder or an injection molding machine, anything that has a continuous process where there's a lot of information going up to the cloud. Then we'll talk about our lab instruments, and then finally the sensors, which actually have the smallest range of data, but still might end up sending a lot up to the cloud. Uh, both the lab instruments and the sensors can utilize an edge device to actually send that data to the cloud, so it doesn't have to be necessarily enabled inside the control. Um, there, the data is actually collected on the individual device and then enabled in action based upon whether you have set points built in or if you're looking for bias trending. So on a lot of these online instruments, we have um, what's called an X-bar chart, right? So you set your upper and lower control limits, um, but then you really want to understand the amplitude of the curve, right? So that every, every process runs what's called a PID loop uh, and is usually a sine wave, right? So it, it peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. What we're really trying to in be interested in is at what point does the process start going abo above the normal peak? When it starts going above the normal peak, that's what we would consider a bias. And at that point in time, when you see a bias develop, can we project out when it will actually break the control chart, right? So instead of um, waiting for your process to go out of spec, we're actually trying to find insights and to be able to see the process starting to go out of control and actually bring it back into control. So basically, less waste. Um, some specific examples that we, we've worked with. Um, really focus a lot on recyclers. Uh, one of them is a garbage bag recycler. So think about all your uh, flexible packaging, right? Anything from the, the little thin paper uh, plastic bags that you get, the t-shirt bags they call them. Uh, we have a recycler that grabs that or recyclers grab those. They size reduce and grind them up and then they end up reprocessing it into pellets that could eventually be used to make other plastic products. Uh, in layman's terms, uh, they're basically trying to make better plastic pellets, and they actually have additives that they build in to do what's called long-chain branching. So they take this post-consumer recycled materials, they grind it up, they re-pelletize it, and then now they have a new product that can go into something else. So it's part of what we would call the spiral economy, uh, not necessarily circular because it's not becoming a bag again, but it's becoming something else. But the whole idea is that um, these recyclers are trying to find ways and streams to reuse the materials that we actually build. And we're, we're proud to be part of that process. Um, another example would be uh, PET recyclers. PET is actually what all water bottles are made out of, right? So when you think of about the water bottles that are made, there's billions of them. And believe it or not, there are billions recycled every year. And to PET, the important thing is a measurement called intrinsic viscosity. And that's really around um, how the moisture content and how dry is the material actually going through. This PET is used in hundreds of brands of clothing today that you're probably unaware of and in the carpets that you walk in. So our process helps to make sure they can see how dry that material is so they can get the highest grade of PET available for the fibers that they're building for either carpets or for clothing. And then, Another case in point is truly about transparency. 
right? And that's around OEM. So our instruments not only provide this data to the customer, but if the customer wants and allows, they could provide a side stream up to their customer. So let's say you're a tier one automotive manufacturer and you're actually looking to uh, understand the material properties of the plastics that are going into your car or into your tractor or into wherever. Well, as you're doing tests using these instruments, the side stream of data can, that's important to that OEM could actually go up to the cloud and over to them on a real-time basis. That's a level of transparency that it was previously uh, unheard of, right? And when we've talked to these OEMs, they're all super interested in that. Uh, so it's a matter of enabling a, a side stream of the data that's already up in the cloud uh, so that you provide transparency to your